Good morning. I'm Heather Stark. I'm the ministry coordinator here. We are so glad you're here with us today, whether in person or online. If you are visiting for the first time, please get a welcome bag. They're in the lobby. See me or one of the greeters. I'd love to get you one of those. Also, there are connect cards in the pews in front of you if you are new or if you have a prayer request. Please fill those out and you can drop it in the offertory box on the way out. The ladies' luncheon is on Saturday, this coming Saturday, the 7th. I think we're full for that, right, Virginia? So um, if you're signed up, we'll see you there. Uh, the youth group will be going to Creation Festival this summer. It's an awesome Christian outdoor concert camping event. Um, please see Keith or Vicki if you would like to sign up for that. Our first responder Sunday will be on May 15th. We will be honoring our first responders in the church and the community. We'll have a retired police officer, Pastor Vaughn's uncle, speaking that day, and we will have a time of fellowship afterwards, but we will still have Sunday school. Um, save the date for VBS, July 17th through the 21st. We will be, do be doing Castle Rock is the theme. See Wendy McNeese if you want to help with that. And COGS, please sign up on the bulletin board. We have our last meeting before the summer break on May 12th. It'll be a lunch followed by a program with the Zimmerman family. Grocery gift cards will be in the lobby today. Um, all of the proceeds for that go to North Star Initiative, which helps combat human trafficking. Uh, I think that's it. I don't see anything. Oh, and the nursery. Uh, we have a new thing for the nursery. We're getting a little bombarded over there. Just for safety, if you do not have a child in the nursery, please do not go back there in that room unless you have a child there. If you want to see one of the kiddos, just wait till they come out after the service. All right, I'm going to open us with prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for this day. I pray that you will open our hearts and minds to hear what you have to say to us through Pastor Vaughn's sermon and through the worship here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now we're going to have Keith Cullen and Brooke Carmen and Katie Wagner come up and talk about the search retreat that they went on last weekend. Well, good morning. good morning. Hey, you guys look great. It's good to see you. Um, so as many of you know, last weekend we had the opportunity for the youth to come to a retreat, and it was called the search retreat. Now, what search means is it's the search for Christian maturity. And as we went, what I was told before going is this would be an opportunity for the kids to grow in their relationship with God, grow in their understanding of the gospel, and grow in Christian community with their peers. So this retreat had college-age students and high school students. And what I'm amazed by, because this was my first time um, experiencing this retreat, I was blown away by the maturity that was there amongst these young believers. Uh, it was all student-led, and they just did such a wonderful job. I was incredibly encouraged. I was incredibly moved. And before going on the retreat, I was a little nervous. I didn't know what to expect. I wasn't sure what this retreat would be exactly. Um, but I have to say, seeing Katie and Brooke and Madison Kendig went as well, um, it blew me away uh, to watch our youth and youth in the surrounding area just be moved by Jesus, to share about Jesus, and to grow in their relationships with one another, but also their relationship with God. So um, that's my two cents. Uh, we're going to hear from Katie and Brooke, and I have a little bit of a written response from Madison because she couldn't be here this morning. So, Katie, uh, what was your favorite part about the retreat? Um, so, my favorite part of the retreat, we had this, so throughout the weekend, we had 11 talks led by most, mostly college students, um, and one of the talks was about prayer. And right after that talk, we had this sort of ceremony where we wrote down a lot of the sins that were weighing on our hearts. So I wrote down my sins, and then we nailed it to a cross um, in the middle room. And then the next day, we took those sins down, and we burned them. They were all put into a bag, and they were burned. And that was probably my favorite part of the weekend because it was a symbolic thing, but it like actually lifted sin off my shoulders. And like, I don't know. It really showed me that God can take that away from you. 
And Katie, how has this weekend caused you to grow in your walk with Jesus? So um, when I first got there, I was nervous, as most people were who are new to coming to this retreat. Um, but I was just overwhelmed with all the love from everybody there and all the love that they showed us that God has for us. Um, so with all of that overwhelming love, I figured that after the retreat, if I just did like little things every day to show myself that God has that much love for me, that would just grow my walk with him even more. So I'm now doing like daily devotionals and I'm praying a lot more. And yeah, it's just changing my heart for God, I guess. <laughs> hey, awesome. Thank you. Um, Brooke. Hi, Brooke. All right. <laughs> what was your favorite part about the retreat? Um, I would say probably there was this time where we were in like a dark room and there was like candles lit and we got like this big envelope and it was filled with like a whole bunch of letters from people and they spent like so much time writing like these long letters with like how much like God loves us and like just like a lot of things that were like really like sweet and I just like that was like really heartwarming and like I was like Somebody could spend that much time just for me. So, like, it made me feel really special. And another question, Brooke. How has this weekend impacted you the most? Um, I would say probably, like, before I went there, I took a lot of things for granted. And I feel like it made me, like, see that, like, I should, like, be, like, more grateful for a lot of things. And like they had a lot of talks that like made me realize things I do wrong or like things, but like it made me like see that like there's a bigger light and that like God has a plan and that I just need to like follow through with it. Hey, awesome. Um, and I'm gonna read the responses from Maddie real quick. She wasn't here, but she did give some answers. So I asked Maddie also what was her favorite part about the retreat, and Maddie said. My favorite part about this past weekend at search was on Saturday night, so this is similar to Katie. Uh, that night we all nailed our biggest sins to a huge cross, and this time was very emotional for me, and I felt very close to God because it resembled that Jesus died for our sins, no matter how big that sin was. The next morning, the leaders put all the pieces of paper into a paper bag, and we all gathered around a fire and watched them burn. It was a real... It was a really life-changing moment to have the burden of my sin lifted and taken away. It was an actual visual of the way our sins are gone when we give our lives to Jesus. The second question that I asked Maddie was, what were your feelings going into the retreat compared to leaving? She says, when I got to the retreat on Friday night, I'm going to be honest and say that I really did not want to be there. <laughs> I was very nervous because I barely knew anyone and I did not know what to expect over the next three days. I didn't think I would grow to love this group of people so much in such a short amount of time, but man, was I proven wrong. I had never clicked so fast with a group of kids in my life, and I truly do feel like I have made lifelong friends that I will cherish forever. I learned so much about myself, but I really grew closer with God more than I ever have. When it came to <clears throat> when it came time to go home on Sunday, I was so sad, but then I realized I was ready to face the troubles of the world with a new outlook, God's outlook. He has really worked in me this past weekend, and I feel like my life has been changed for the better. I am so grateful for this experience, and God is good. Um, so I just want to thank everybody for praying for our time and for supporting uh, these young ladies to go on this retreat. And uh, truly, for me, it was just so impactful. The whole time I was at the retreat, I'm just watching these young girls grow, and I'm watching you guys grow with the whole group uh, who were there, and it's just awesome. Uh, so, And I know Maddie wanted to be here to stand up and share this in front of you, um, which would have been a lot better than me sharing it, but it's great to hear from her. And also, I learned that Brooke likes to read. I saw her reading all those letters, and I was like, I knew it. I knew you liked reading, but also... Um, we are just encouraged to see you ladies step up and share this uh, with us. So I would like to pray uh, for these two and for Maddie as well. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you so much for this, uh, this past week. And I can't believe it was already, uh, uh, it's been a whole week since we were at this retreat. And Lord, it was just such a wonderful time to grow 
in our understanding of who you are and how much you love us, and Lord, to grow in Christian community and see that when we gather together, when we, when we come together and, and learn about you and share your love with one another, um, Lord, you are exactly who you said you are. Um, you have made a way for us to have peace with you. Our sins can be lifted as these ladies have shared. Um, and Lord, sometimes we just need that uplift to remind us that you truly do love us. So God, may we love you because you have loved us first. We love you, Jesus. I thank you for these ladies. I pray that their faith would continue to grow as the next coming weeks uh, just come and the, they reach the end of the school year. I pray that they finish well and continue to be a light in their school, in their workplace, and in their families and here in this community. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for this opportunity. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. My turn to say good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. It's a beautiful day currently. We'll take it while we can have it. Um, I'm going to ask that you stand and join me as we begin our worship and song by singing Hope Has a Name.
again, and we have victory, not because of our own power, or because of our own want, or our own strength, but it's all through Christ. So we're going to continue by singing, yet not I, but through Christ in me.
I wish everybody had the opportunity to stand up here and hear an entire congregation praising and just singing out to God. It's so moving and amazing. Um, and as you can probably hear, I really need your voice today. So it's beautiful. Keep it up. We're going to continue singing above all. Will you pray with me as we think about the offering this morning? Father, we're told that you love a cheerful giver. So I pray that as you look at our hearts this morning, you'll see that, that we have a lot of joy in our hearts because you are such a good, good father and that you care for us and provide for us in so many ways. Thank you, Father, for all the gifts and the talents and abilities that you have given us, the Bride of Christ here at the Mount Joy Church of God. And I pray, Father, that as we give our, of our monetary offerings, that it'll be pleasing in your sight, and that our sacrifices of praise this morning were pleasing in your sight. But we realize, Father, that every good and perfect gift comes from you. So, Father, as we look to this time to give our offering, we're grateful, Father, that you have provided for us and that you care for us spiritually and materially. So we're, our hearts are filled with joy, and we truly are grateful because you're such a good and loving, sovereign Father who has given Jesus Christ uh, to pay for the price for our sins, and that makes us really rich in Christ. Thank you for giving us everything we need for life and godliness, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, uh, kids ages 4 through 7 are dismissed for Children's Church. So we made a last minute decision, you can see communion uh, elements sitting down here, but we made a last minute decision this morning to go back to our cups, um, thought we were sort of over COVID. We have four or five people in our church right now who have COVID this week, and so we decided to go back to this, that's why uh, we passed these out to you. So just give you the reason for that. 
Let me just read to you a portion of scripture from 1 Corinthians. It says this, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. It says, So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. So then, when you come together, it will not be for judgment. So this portion of Scripture shares with us the importance of coming to partake of communion. It's a serious matter because we're reflecting back on what Christ did for us. We're reflecting back on the tremendous price that Christ paid for our sin. It's for a time for us to stop. And as we come and we're going to partake of the elements in just a moment, this portion of Scripture says we should examine our hearts first. So I'm going to ask us to bow our heads. And with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I'm going to ask you to pray. And, and you could pray what you want to pray, but maybe it's something like this. Maybe it's, Lord, help me to confess any sin that you bring to my mind right now. It could be the sin of commission, things we've said or done or uh, people that we've hurt this week that maybe we need to make right. We need to confess that sin. Or maybe it's sins of omission. Maybe it's things that we should have done and we didn't do. And so whatever the Holy Spirit brings to your mind, would you take a moment and confess that sin? If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, thank you that you are a God that forgives our sin. Father, there's not one of us here that deserve to spend eternity in heaven with you. The best we can do is as filthy rags, as the book of Isaiah says. But Lord, yet while we were yet sinners, you died for us. Lord, we are so thankful for your love for us. We are so thankful for your grace that is fresh and new every day. Lord, we are so thankful for your mercy that you show us. And so, Lord, as we stop this morning and we reflect on what you did for us at Calvary, Lord, when you gave yourself willingly, Lord, your life wasn't taken, it was given willingly. And Lord, so we are thankful that you loved us that much. So, Lord, thank you for your broken body. Thank you for this wafer that reminds us of your body that was broken for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Open your wafer there, and I'll read the scripture. It says, He broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
We want to return thanks for the grape juice that reminds us of Christ's blood that washes away our sin. I'm going to ask Pastor Keith, Keith, if you would <clears throat> stand, excuse me, if you would come here and uh, pray. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to sit and reflect on the gift that you have given us. Lord, you came and your blood was shed for our sins. Lord, and you have cleansed us of all unrighteousness so long as we confess and we bring our sins to you, knowing that you are able and your sin, uh, our sin is no match for your grace. Lord, remind us of that. And Lord, I pray that um, we would come, come before you humbly but also that we can stand in victory knowing that you have made a way. You are the victor, and we get to stand with you in that. So, Lord, as we take of this cup, Lord, I, pr I pray that we would remember that your blood was shed for our sin and for our sake because of the great love for which you've loved us. Amen. Once again, the word of God says, <clears throat> in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. It's a time of remembrance. It's also a time of thanksgiving. And we can thank the Lord for what he did for us. So I wanted us to end our communion time this morning with a time of thanksgiving. So we're going to be doing a responsive reading from Psalms 104. And uh, so I'll read the light print, and then you come in as a congregation in the bold print. Brothers and sisters, since the Lord has now fed us at this table, let us praise God's holy name with heartfelt thanksgiving. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. All that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Do not forget all his benefits. Who forgives us all our iniquity. Who heals all our diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit. Who grounds you with steadfast love and mercy. The Lord is merciful and gracious. He does not deal with us according to our sin. Nor us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As, for, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, Who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, and will also give us all things with him. Therefore, shall my mouth and heart show forth the praise of the Lord from this time forth forever. Amen. That's from Psalms 104. It's a great text of thanksgiving as we thank the Lord this morning through communion. Let's stand. We're going to sing again. For the bo older boys and girls that are still in here, if you didn't leave, I have a paper, and you can come down and get that paper and a snack. If that's for the older kids that are still here. Let's stand as we continue in worship this morning. We're going to continue with the song, My Story. And I believe this one may be a little bit newer to some of you, or at least newer inside here the, in this church currently. Um, however, those of you who, um, you know, grew up with hymns, keep an ear out, keep a heart open. Um, there's a little throw in here for you. So um, we'll continue with my story.
would hear love that never gave up. And if I told you my story, you would hear love, but it wasn't mine. finish with a medley. It's a peppy little medley, so if you need to dance, please feel free. Um, it's, uh, we're going to go one right to the other. You'll be familiar with them.
Lawrence, you may have a seat. Amen. Thank you, praise team. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn them to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to be looking at just three verses today. And then next week, we will be finishing the book of Ephesians. And uh, it's been a journey. I know we started last September, and we'll finish. And then we have several things going on this month. Pastor Keith finishes the month preaching for us. And then we go into the month of June, and uh, we start our series called Hot Topics. Somebody asked me this morning, will we be publishing what those topics will be? And in the next week or so, we will be publishing, so you can choose the weeks you want to come and not come. <laughs> no, not really. But uh, we will be publishing, so you know what those hot topics are that we'll be covering. Let me just say before I preach this morning... Um, just a, I want to consider it a housekeeping thing. Daryl and Jane Groth, this is their last Sunday with us. And I hate to see them go. I prayed against it, I told them. But uh, <laughs> I saw about a month and a half ago, she posted to pray for them. They had something, and uh, I asked her a couple weeks later, what was it? She had a job interview. Was it Idaho? Idaho. Idaho. And uh, she went out to that job interview and uh, they offered her the job the same weekend. Daryl got a job out there. And so even though I prayed against them leaving, <laughs> they prayed harder. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm so excited for them. And uh, so at the end of the service today, I'm going to ask them to stand at the back door with me. And I want you to just say goodbye to them and greet them. Let them know how much you've appreciated it. I've enjoyed getting to know them, but I'm certainly going to miss them. And I'm sure you will too. So I, I wanted you to know that this is their last Sunday with us. And we love you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead to the next slide. I want to show you a picture. In this picture, and I'm sure you've seen it. It's a picture from where? Ukraine. Ukraine. Certainly, I, I know you're like I am every day. I, I read, I listen to the news about what's going on in Ukraine, and, and my, my heart breaks for our brothers and sisters in Christ. As I shared with you, the 250,000 boys and girls that have been involved in Awana there, and I just think about all those things. And even in all of that, it still seems so far away, doesn't it? It still does seem far away. Because really, war seems far away. I, I wanted to do something this morning, uh, just to start the message a little bit different. I want all of those men who served our country to stand. Would you do that? All of those men and women. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> Can beat me afterwards for that one. So I want to give them a hand. Would there be someone who would be willing to share just for a minute how difficult it was to serve in a war situation? Is there anybody who would do that? Okay, I'm going to ask everybody else to be seated. 20 years ago last Saturday, I got a phone call that, that changed our lives. Um, and it, at first, that I, could, I didn't know where we were going, and they didn't tell us for a while. I will share with you that going to Afghanistan, I was with a great group of people, and I was concerned more for my family at home than I was for my personal safety. But one of the most surreal moments that I had, um, we went in on C-17s, yeah. And when that, we landed in the middle of the night in some time zone that I, Afghanistan is so poor, they don't even have their own time zone. <laughs> <laughs> They're like eight and a half hours different. Not eight, not nine, eight and a half. Um, but when the, when the back end of that plane went down, middle of the night, and we walked out, I had no idea what I was getting into. 
and for some of you folks who have been there, in terms of we walked out with our battle rattle on, I didn't know if somebody was gonna be firing at us or what was happening. As it turns out, it, everything turned out, but that was one of the most surreal moments of my life where I knew I would never be the same again. Thank you. Thank you for sharing and thank you for serving and all of those who stood. Thank you for serving our country. Um, I don't know what it's like and there's many who didn't stand today who don't know what it's like to be in a war situation. For me, uh, the Vietnam War and the draft ended just as I was graduating from high school. So I never was able, I never had the privilege to serve our country like you did. But something that we don't realize, and maybe you sit here this morning and like me, you've never served in a war situation, and you've never had to face what you faced when that plane landed, and how surreal it was. But I'm here to tell you this morning that everyone who sits here who knows Jesus Christ as their Savior, you're a warrior. You're in a battle. Maybe not a physical battle like many of these brave people who sit with us who fought for our country and we so appreciate the freedoms that we enjoy but every one of us are in a battle and you see this street filled with all kinds of tanks and all kinds of paraphernalia from war I want to tell you that there are all kinds of casualties of spiritual war that I see all the time and spiritual war is just as devastating as real war. It really is. I've seen what spiritual war does in the life of people. I watched a young man named Wayne who had so much potential. So much potential. I watched him come to Christ. I remember baptizing him. I remember working with him. I remember him going to Chicago and going through a, a, a uh, course out there to become a police chaplain, and he was the police chaplain there in Magnolia. But he warred with heroin. Eventually, he would have to give up his badge because he went back using heroin again, and eventually he walked away from Christ. His son would die of heroin. I'm sure there are many other stories of casualties in this spiritual battle. I watched the 18-year-old young man who proclaimed to know Christ as a Savior. He was one of my family-based kids. I watched him battle with marijuana, and he got some bad synthetic marijuana, and it killed him. I remember going to his funeral and just standing there crying because he had lost the battle. Now, overall, I believe he's in heaven, and he won the victory, but here on earth, he lost the battle. War is costly. And that's where we find ourselves in the text this week and next week. So let's read our text. Go to the next slide. So walking out life, it says to stand strong. And our two verses here, or three verses, go ahead to the next slide. I think maybe one more, I'm sorry. It says, finally be strong in the Lord and in, and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There is a lot said in those three verses, a whole lot. And the first thing I want you to realize again is the context. 
the context of this is very important. Now you'll notice we, we've been going through and studying it almost verse by verse. And so this follows an important portion of, the, of Scripture. It follows the portion that deals with what? Husband and wife relationships, parent and child, child to parent relationships, and then in the work area, employed employer. So it's right after that that he deals with this thing of spiritual warfare. So let me just start off by saying this this morning, that sometimes the greatest spiritual warfare takes place in the home. It really does. It takes place in marriages. It takes place between a husband and a wife. And why? Why is there so much spiritual battle that goes on between husbands and wives? I'll tell you this, because in the scripture we read in Ephesians, it says that the marriage is a picture of Christ and his bride. Think about that. That the marriage, your marriage, if you sit here this morning, your marriage is a picture of Christ's relationship to his bride, the church. And if there's one place that I believe Satan wants to destroy and Satan wants to attack, it is the home. And so he's going to do everything he can to bring disharmony. disharmony. He's going to do everything he can to bring trouble within to a marriage. That's why even within Christian marriages, there's not a whole lot of difference between the world's divorce rate and Christian divorce rate. That's why, listen, teenager, you sit here, and I want you to realize the reason you struggle with obedience towards your parents is because Satan wants everything that you can do. He wants you to be disobedient. He wants to break up the unity of your home. The parents, the same thing. Why do you struggle sometimes with your kids? It's because Satan wants to destroy the home. And then again, we could go into the workplace. And I see many Christians who struggle in their workplace also. It's because, listen, if Satan can destroy your testimony in your workplace, that's your mission field. See, it's like missionaries who go to a different country and end up struggling and get sent home by their mission board because they could make it. When you go to work and you're not living the type of life that you need to live for Christ, you're ruining your mission field. That's why the struggle is so great. That's why the battle is so great in these areas. And so that's why he's going to share with us how we need to stand within this battle. And, and Bob pointed out this morning back in our devotional time in the back, he talked about the word stand, and, and it's there several different times. It's in verse 11. He says that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Then down in verse 13 that we'll look at next week, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil days. Uh, having done also, stand firm. And then ver verse 14, stand therefore having fastened. So this word stand is important. This word here, he's saying, listen, I need to take a stand. I need to stand. And so we're going to be talking about how do I stand and what do I wear to stand and what does that look like this week and next, like, next week. The battleground is spiritual warfare goes on every day in your life. The devil will try to stir up doubts in our minds and divisions in our churches by undermining our confidence in the gospel and in the word of God. Our goal is to, our goal is to survive, to hold our ground, standing firm together in the gospel conviction. To stand firm to the end is to win like the way Ellen Eliezer did. Eliezer was one of David's mighty men. And when all, of El, when all of the rest of the Israelites ran from the Philistines, Eliezer stood. It says this in 2 Samuel. It says, he stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hands grew tired and the sword froze to his hand. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. Your enemy, the devil, is like a lion, the Bible says. He's what? He's moving to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. 
And the Bible says he is a what? He is a roaring lion. And do you know when a lion roars? A lion roars when it's about to attack. That's why it says, and listen, Satan is always about the business of attacking us in whatever areas he can. So how, how do we, how we look at this battle? How are we going to do it? So it says, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So that word finally, he's saying, listen, we're getting to the end. This isn't any less important than anything I've said before, but we're at the end now. This is the last part. It's just as important as the first part of this book. So he said, but here we are at the end. So how do we? And the, so the first thing we're going to look at is the preparation, the strength that we have in the Lord, because he says, finally, be strong in who? In my might? Be strong in who? In who? The Lord. doesn't say to be strong in your preacher. It says to be strong in the Lord, doesn't it? It doesn't say to depend on me for your strength. It says to be strong in the Lord. So what does that look like? What does it mean to be strong in the Lord? What is that preparation? So the first one is to realize who I am in Christ because I'm standing in the Lord. So I got to take you all the way back to one of the first messages we preached in the book of Ephesians. And uh, we preached it over a couple different weeks. And this was the mirror that we have brought back. It's a great way to end our series the same way we started. Because in that first book, that first chapter of Ephesians, we found out who we are in Christ. That's sort of what we've been talking about. Who are we in Christ? And so we, we, when we look into the mirror, this is who we are. I'm a saint. I'm a saint who sins what? Occasionally. I, I'm a saint though. Don't call me a sinner. I'm a saint. That's a big thing, we, and we said, we said that right from the beginning. I'm a saint who sins occasionally. If, if I say I'm a sinner, that's like I'm giving you permission to sin. No, you are a saint who sins occasionally. I'm loved. I'm saved. I'm God's handiwork. I'm alive in Christ. I'm blessed. I'm chosen. I'm adopted. I'm redeemed. I'm forgiven. I'm sealed. I am rich in eternal blessing. And one of the things that we have that we can stand firm in is who, this is who I am. So when Satan comes at me, I can say, hey, Satan, let me tell you who I am. Let me tell you who you're fighting with. Let me tell you, Satan, I'm a saint. I'm loved by God. Man, Satan, get out of here. I'm saved. I know where I'm going to spend eternity. Hey, Satan, listen, I'm God's handiwork. He's not finished with me yet. He's still working on me. Let me remind you, Satan, I'm alive in Christ. Just like Christ arose victorious over death, I identify with that. That's who I am in Christ. I'm blessed, Satan. I'm chosen. Let me tell you, Satan, before the foundation of the world, you, God, chose me. So get out of here. Do you ever talk to Satan like that? You should. You should. Listen, this is who we are, man. I'm redeemed. God paid a tremendous price for me, Satan. I've been bought and I'm forgiven. Don't, don't keep throwing my old sins at me. Don't keep throwing them at me. They're already under the blood. They've been as washed away as far as the east is from the west. Let me tell you, Satan, when you remind me of those old sins, they're gone. Tell Satan, hey, they're gone, Satan. This is who I am in Christ. And the greatest thing that we have is our identity in Christ. And so the preparation, I don't stand in my own strength. I stand in the strength of who I am in Christ. Not that I'm the preacher here, not that I'm this or that. I stand in who I am in Christ. That is preparation for the battle. And every day we need to remind ourselves who we are in Christ. I don't stand in my own strength. I, it says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. The second thing is I need to remember not only who I am in Christ, but I need to remember that the victory is won. The victory is already won. In the ultimate sense, the church battles with Satan's are already won. 
In his crucifixion and his resurrection, Jesus destroyed Satan and his power of sin and of death. Trust in Jesus Christ initiates that victory for us. Now listen, as long as we're on earth, we're going to lose some skirmishes. But the victory, the overall victory has already been won. It's already been won. You can't take it away from me. When I die, when I die and and Pastor Keith does my funeral, he's going to stand up here before you and he's going to tell you, listen, he's more alive than he's ever been before. Why? Because I'm going to be walking the streets of gold. I'm going to be in heaven. I'm not going to be struggling with sin anymore. Why? Because the victory's already won. And I know this is a morbid thought, but some days I get up and some days I think, man, it would be great just to be dead in heaven. And amen, that's right. <laughs> amen. I know my wife doesn't like to hear that. But some days I think, man, it would just be great to go to heaven, wouldn't it? It would be great to wake up. Why? Because the victory's already won. And then how is this strength that we're talking about here, how is it appropriated? How is this, what's the appropriation of this strength? And it comes through the means of grace. It comes through prayer. It comes through knowledge of obedience to the word and faith to the promises of God. Let me tell you, this, this strength that we stand in has appropriation through prayer. We're going to see next week that prayer is one of the, one of the offensive weapons my other offensive weapon is the Word of God. If you're not reading God's Word and you're not praying, you're not on the offensive against Satan. That is, we're going to see it next week and how it works. We, we need to take up the Word of God. I am so thankful for this little lady right on the front row here, Nikki. You know why? Because I challenged you guys to memorize Scripture. And every month, Every month, January, February, March, and April, she's come to me and said her verses. There's one of the greatest warriors in our church right there. I appreciate that so much because she's memorizing God's Word. She's memorizing God's Word. I, I love our Awana program. I love our boys and girls on Wednesday night saying Scripture. That's why we do Awana, so we can hide God's word in their heart. Little Jared and Sabrina's little daughter, Lila, she comes to me, and I don't know how many times she's quoted John 3.16 to me. <laughs> Every time she comes up to me. I loved it last week. We were downstairs, and the kids were waiting in a line, and, and some, but one of the little kids, I think it was Chloe, said, oh, that's Pastor Vaughn. And Lila says, no, that's Pastor Dick. <laughs> But I love it because she loves John 3.16 and she says it to me. And I mean, they, they just started coming. And I, and I love when I hear people quoting scripture. It's our, it's our offensive weapon. It's our appropriation for the strength. God gave us the word of God to memorize, to hide it in our heart, to meditate on it. God gave it to us because we need it for the battle. And we need prayer. Prayer is an offensive weapon. And we'll see how to use it next week as an offensive weapon. But that's our appropriation for the battle of these weapons that he's given us to use. And so when we think of our strength, it comes through how? By realizing who I am in Christ, by realizing the victory's already been won, I'm already on the winning side, and then using the appropriation of the things, prayer and grace and God's word and obedience to the word of God and standing on the promises of God's word. When I do those things, I can have victory. And then he says in this portion, but put on the whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. And so here's the provision. First of all, it's a permeance. It's not talking about putting on and taking off and putting back on. This scripture, the way it is written here, is saying that we should always wear the full armor of God. 
You know, it, it's not a uniform to wear on occasion. It is something that I wear all the time. It's something that I keep on even when I'm laying in bed that I'm already ready to do uh, battle no matter what. And so I wear that armor all the time. And we're going to look at each piece of the armor next week. But this is what he says. Listen, this armor I've provided you. And it's interesting that when Paul is writing here the book of Ephesians, in the very first chapter, we reminded you that he's a prisoner. And he's probably chained to a Roman soldier. So as he's writing this book, it's easy for him to, to in a sense, get this allegory in his mind of what he's going through because he's chained to a Roman soldier. And so he sees that soldier's breastplate. And he sees that soldier's shield and his sword. And he sees all of these things. He sees his sandals, how his feet, Lord, have those sandals. And we're going to see how each of those are so important next week. But he said, listen, I need to stand firm. When used in a military sense, it had a high, the idea of holding a critical position. I have a critical position that I'm standing here with my battle gear on. And we have to realize that as a Christian, we do battle all the time. And then who is our enemy? Look at it. It says, he says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces that are evil in the heavenly places. So the first thing he says is this. He says, we wrestle. We wrestle. Now, we have some wrestlers here. I know that. I'm one of those wrestlers. And uh, I love wrestling. I love the, when the college wrestling is on. I love to watch, and I, I, I especially love Penn State. they got a tremendous wrestling program, better than Ohio State. <laughs> <laughs> but I love wrestling. I do, man. I, and when I wrestled in, in high school, we had this little room that we practiced, and it was, it was like, I don't know how big it was, maybe 20 by 20, and it had mats on the floor, mats on the wall. And then it had this reading on the ceiling that said, if you can read this, you're lazy. Because anybody knows, as a wrestler, the place you don't want to be is where? On your back, looking up. And so if it, that's what my coach would say, get up, stand up. And I can still, still hear those words. And I'm out on the mat wrestling. Get up, stand up, what's wrong with you? You're being lazy. And he'd be yelling at me. And then there was my dad, the mild manner accountant, who never yelled all his life except when he went crazy at wrestling matches. Get up, Dick, stand up, what's wrong with you? Stand, stand. And I, those words still ring out of my mind. Stand, stand up, get off your back. And that's the same thing God's saying here. Stand, get up. Put, keep that armor. Use that armor that I've given you. Why do you need to stand in the face of the devil? Here's the reasons. He tells you. He says, because it's against the schemes of the devil. He says that back there in verse 11, that the devil has schemes. That, that word schemes mean he has methods. He's crafty. He's cunning. He's deceptive. deceptive. And that, that term is used of a wild beast. It's used of a wild beast who's cunning and stalks his prey. That's what Satan does. And how does Satan, how does Satan do this? Three, three ways or four ways quickly. First of all, he gets us to doubt God's word. Go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. And what did he do, say to Adam and Eve? Did God really say that? Come on, surely you're not going to die if you eat that fruit. And so he gets us to doubt God's word. He gets us to make sin look and feel good. He gets it. Every time I do these things I should not do, they make me feel good. The Bible calls that in Hebrews chapter 11, the fleeting pleasures of sin. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that sin doesn't have pleasure. Sure it has pleasure. Sure it does. And that's one of the things that Satan does. The, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. He makes sin look good. Man, that, that drug or that alcohol or whatever it is, it's going to make you feel good or sex. 
It's going to make you feel good, but let me tell you, there's always a price to pay. There's pleasure, it says, for a season. Do you get that? There's pleasure and sin for a season. But then the Bible says you're going to reap what you sow. You're going to reap what you sow. And you're going to reap in the kind that you sow. And I would use the story of David. David committed adultery, committed murder, and he rebelled against God. What did he sow in the life of his family? Adultery, murder, and rebellion against God. What you sow, you will reap. But Satan won't remind you of that. I remember I grew up in the era where cigarette commercials were a big thing on television. And it wasn't it amazing that everybody who smoked had, I mean, first of all, it started with the cowboy look. Remember that? You know, Marlboro man. Or, or, you know, alcohol commercials. I mean, have you ever seen them show cirrhosis of the liver? Have you ever seen a commercial that starts off, let me show you cirrhosis of the liver. This is what it looks like if you drink all the time. You ever see that? No, you don't see that, do you? You don't see. They never show you lungs filled with cancer, do they? Hey, let me show you some lungs filled with cancer from smoking. They don't show you that stuff on television, do they? No, because they always make sin look good. Doesn't it? Or... If you could drive this kind of car, this is what you'll be like. You'll have it all. You'll have it all. Just, just buy this car. If you could drive this Mercedes-Benz, this is the type of life you would have. See, Satan always makes sin look good. Not only that, but Satan has all kinds of lies. He's full of lies. Sin is attractive because it brings us pleasure. And he, and he says, listen, here's some of the lies he tells us. You've fallen again. There's no hope for you. Have you ever told yourself, boy, I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to have that thought again. I'm never going to do that sin again. Never, no way. And the next thing you know, you're doing what? You're doing it. You're doing the same thing. We've all been there if we're honest. I've been there. I'm still there sometimes. You know, and this is a stupid thing, but one of my greatest struggles is speeding. And I've said, I've got on 283 and said, I'm going to do the speed limit going to Lancaster. <laughs> and I do real good going, it's coming home. <laughs> I, 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 and I'm breaking Romans chapter 13. It says what? Obey the law. And it's a silly little thing, but it's true. And, and I mean, that's a little thing, but there's a lot of other things. But listen to this verse from Proverbs 24, 16. A righteous man falls seven times and he lays there. Come on, think about it for a second. Is that what it says? No, it says a righteous man falls seven times, then he what? Rises up. He rises up, he gets up. And what kind of man is this? This is a righteous man who's falling. This is a man who says, God, I want to serve you. God, I want to do what's right. God, I want to live for you. And this righteous man keeps falling. Remember Peter? Peter fell often. Listen, a righteous man falls seven times, but what does he do? He's that wrestler. He what? He gets up. He keeps getting up. And that's what we need to do. And it's just not seven times. Go into the New Testament where Peter says to the Lord, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother? How about seven times? And Peter's being generous because Jewish law said three times. So Peter said, listen, I'm going to go way beyond here. I'm going to forgive my brother seven times. Aren't I really spiritual? And Jesus turns around and says, no, what, Peter? Seven times 70. 490. And I don't think it means that I keep a notebook and that every time... Keith offends me, which is like 440 now. No. 
Every time he offends me, I, when he gets to 490, I can finally close the book and say, I'm done with you, buddy. Because God doesn't do that to you. He doesn't say, I'm done with you. He keeps forgiving you. Now, it's not an excuse to sin, but listen, when we fall, Satan will lie to us and say, just keep lying there. Don't get up. You might as well just give up. You're just going to do it again. But a righteous man gets up and goes again. You've fallen again. There's no hope. Or Satan might tell you, you're still drawn to the world and by your lust, so you're obviously not a true disciple. You're, you're still obviously, you're not saved. You're, you're still drawn to worldly things. Wrong. Remember what Paul said about his struggle? He said, you have a flesh which has nothing good in it. Your flesh has nothing good in it. This can sound dismal, but it's a fact. It's opposite. It, it, it helps us to realize that garbage that you are being tempted to do in your flesh, it's not your heart. It's your flesh that's the struggle. If your heart and mind is given to God, even like the Apostle Paul who said, listen, with my what? With my mind, with my heart, I, I want to do what's right. But then there's this thing, the law, my flesh, that always draws me to the things that are wrong. And Paul says, it is a struggle that I go through all the time. He said, I find in a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God, according to the inward man. I delight in the Bible. I delight in doing what's right. But I see another law, my members, warring against the law of my mind. Did you pick it up? I see another law, warring, the law of sin, the law of the flesh. It's warring against my mind. It's always in a battle. I'm always going to be tempted. Temptation is not a sin. When we fall to it, it becomes a sin. But temptation is not a sin. We're going to be tempted all our life. There's all kinds of lies that he tells us. Oh, don't make enough, I don't make enough money to give. Or I don't make enough money to tithe. He's going to tell you that. God is not really good. Satan's going to tell you that. Satan's going to tell you, I need a boyfriend or girlfriend to be happy. Now, that's only if you're not married. <laughs> Satan's going to tell you, life is about me. He's going to tell you all kinds of lies. Because the battle is against the demons of hell. He said we struggle. It's hand-to-hand -hand combat, that word struggle. We struggle not against flesh and blood, but against what? And he gives us, he gives us a list here of demons, the rulers, the powers, the world forces of darkness, spiritual forces. These are the different stratas of ranking of demons. Paul's purpose here is not to explain the details of demonic hi hierarchy, but to give us some idea it's a sophisticated, powerful war that we're involved in. He doesn't go into all the details of what each of those represent, but each of those are different levels or strata of demonic power. And let me tell you, there is demonic power going all around us. And we as Christians sometimes just, oh, okay, this Christian life's no big deal. I'm, yes, it is a big deal. It's a battle every day. It's demonic. I remember in one Sunday service in New Jersey, um, we were just finishing up and we gave a, a, an invitation and there was a person who came forward. Um, it was a, a lady and uh, she was demon-possessed. And... Uh, uh, several of our elders gathered around and were praying over her, and there, there was a voice that came out of her that was not her voice. Um, I remember working with a, another lady who had a demon within her, and as I was talking to her and praying with her, her face literally sort of moved almost like to the side. Her eyes were drawn, her mouth was drawn. It was one of the scariest things I've ever faced in my life. See, she had been involved in all kinds of demonic activity through the Ouija board and other things and drugs. She'd exposed herself to all these things. And uh, I believe that she has demons that she struggles with. These things are real. 
But again, we're on the winning side. We're on the winning side. Just an illustration to close. Uh, remember D-Day, the landing, and D-Day, the Allied forces in France on June 6, 1944. Remember that? It was a decisive victory that ensured victory on the Western Front in World War II. Although the Allied troops had to keep fighting the Germans all the way to Berlin, it wasn't until May 5th of 1945, almost 12 months later, that was finally ended. But in the interim, in the interim period, the battle was fierce, but ultimately victory was no longer in doubt. But in that period... It was fierce. And so I'm here to tell you this morning that we're in the interim period right now. We're in the period from when Christ died and rose victorious over sin and death until someday I'm either going to be called to heaven or Jesus Christ is going to come back and set up his kingdom. And someday he's going to destroy this present world and everything that's involved. And he's going to set up a brand new world, a brand new Jerusalem that will come down out of heaven. And at that time, we will have what? We will enjoy total victory. But we're in that interim period right now, folks. We're in the heart of the battle. We're in the heart of the battle. You say, Dick, I don't really feel like I'm in a battle. If you don't feel like you're in a battle... Maybe two things. Maybe you're truly not saved. And I know that's harsh. But the second thing is maybe you're not just living close enough to God at all. See, if you're out in the world just playing around, doing your thing, whatever it is, sex, drugs, alcohol, bad attitudes, if you're just out living for yourself, Satan doesn't have to worry about you. He really doesn't. He's got you right where he wants you. But if you're a child of God, a woman of God who's really seeking to live for God and really trying to do what's right, you're going to know you're in a battle. You're going to know it. Because every day you're going to be struggling. Every day you're going to be bothered by sin. Every day you're going to be tempted. Every day you're going to face difficulties. You're going to go through trials. You're going to go through tribulation. Why? Because when you're trying to live close to God, Satan and the demons of hell are going to do everything they can against you. They are. We're in a battle, folks. And if you're not in that battle, you better ask yourself, am I really saved? Or maybe I've just gotten so far away from God, I'm off doing my own thing. I'm... Satan's not even worried about me anymore. He doesn't have to worry because my flesh is winning the battle. Let's pray. I know this isn't one of those, and next week's won't be either one of those feel good messages that you walk away saying, Oh, wow, you know, that really made me feel good. No, this is a serious, serious message today. We are in a battle. And can I ask you, do you feel like you're in a battle? Or maybe you'd sit here to say, Dick, you know what? I, I'm not. I'm not where I need to be with the Lord. And I, we're, we're going to do something we usually don't do today. And I know we're late, but I just really feel led to do this. And I'm going to ask Bob to play quietly. And if you're really challenged about standing for the Lord. Or maybe you're challenged today that I'm away from the Lord, so I'm not even really in the battle. I've walked away, and I'm living my own life and my own sin, and I'm right now enjoying the pleasures of sin. But the reaping is coming. So as Bob plays, if God's spoken to your heart today, and, and, and you want to pray, you want to say, I, I, I want to be that Christian who stands 
or I'm far away from God. I want to pray with either Keith or you, Dick, about where my life is. For, for the next few minutes, we're just going to open the pulpit here. And you can come and play, pray at the front pew, pray here on the steps, wherever you want. You can turn and your, get on your knees and pray there. But can we do some serious business this morning with the Lord as Bob plays? Keith and I are down front if you want to come pray with us this morning. Or if you want to come and get on your knees and pray just with you and God about standing firm in this battle. Or getting some things right to get it back in the battle. We'll close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for, again, the word of God and how powerful it is. And Lord, next week when we look at what you've given to us to fight this battle with, Lord, the offensive weapons and the defensive gear that we have, Lord, may we be excited about what you've provided for us. Lord, help us as we're out and about in the world this week to realize that, Lord, we're in a battle, not only for our soul, but the soul of others. And sometimes that's why it's so hard for us to witness, because Satan's going to do everything he can to discourage us from talking to other people about the good news of Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to stand firm, as the Scripture tells us. In your name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask the Groffs to go ahead and make your way to the back, if you would. Make sure you come by and see them and give them a good welcome.